So hi and welcome. Um, and thanks for being here despite the keynote running in parallel. <laughs> running off now saying you forgot doesn't count. That's not okay. Um, so we will tell you how we approach the design of a game called Mayo Beats, which you, by the way, can also try out upstairs. And this is a game for a prosthesis training. And Cosima, she works at a specialized laborato laboratory for treating amputees. And she will start by walking you through the clinical side of our project. So I would like to present a typical case as it is every day at our clinic. And for that purpose, I would like Faris here to pose as a patient. So imagine him as a patient. It's not him. He still has all of his arms. <laughs> so our patient was a construction worker and uh, he was building new apartment buildings in Austria. And they were using this drill uh, to drill a hole and suddenly the drill stopped. They didn't know why. So Faris went there to check it out and he found that there was a larger rock stuck in the drill. But he was clever and he told his colleague to stop the machine, to power it off. And then he reached down and he took the stone, he threw it away. And in that moment, his colleague was, okay, Faris is finished, and he turned on the machine again. So the drill started drilling again. But unfortunately for our patient, his sleeve got caught in the drill, and it was pulling him in his sleeve and his arm. So his arm was torn off right above the elbow. And he was a quick thinker, so he took his torn off arm and he put it in the passenger seat of his car and he drove to the nearest hospital, which was us. <laughs> so we tried to reattach his limb. Here you can see it in the picture. It's wrapped in foil and it's soaked in um, sterilizing liquid. And we tried to reattach it during an eight hour surgery but unfortunately, um, we had to re-amputate uh, due to infection. So this is him now. This is the stump, and Faris will need a myoelectric prosthesis to get back to everyday life. And this prosthesis is controlled through the muscle signals he still has in his residual limb. <laughs> <laughs> and this is also a patient of ours, and you can see the um, prosthesis on his left arm. And he's actually a Paralympics winner in snowboarding and uh, also at the Cybertlon. Okay, Faris, now let's do some myoelectric prosthesis training. Yeah. What you can see here is a graph of Faris muscle activity. And we will play an electrode here on the biceps. And if Faris flexes his biceps, then we would see a curved peak. Do we see a peak? Uh, no? Oh, oh. oh sorry. <laughs> and if he stretches it, there is also an electrode on the triceps, then we would see a peak here. <laughs> so this is the control he will use. So, so it's really just those two channels, and you can see it in the lower channels. And there will come a time when there are two peaks simultaneously. And this is called a co-contraction. A co-contraction means that he flexes or contracts both his biceps and his triceps. This is used for switching in the prosthetic device between the joints. So for example, one joint movement is hand opening and closing. And if we switch now with this co-contraction, it would be hand rotation. If we switch again, it would be elbow flexion because those are the joints he does not have anymore. <laughs> yeah, and <laughs> as you can see, this is not a very engaging um, therapy, and I think I've lost my patient already. So we have really a problem in keeping the patient engaged over time. So we usually lose the patients after five minutes. They just wander off. Yeah, so, so basic basically how I would train is just follow those curves and try to flex and uh, flex to the other side and just watch that curve as it goes, and that's really boring. And aside from that, the, the whole process is also frustrating. It's not easy. It takes a long time. And so luckily, I'm not really in construction, so I'm a game designer and researcher. And what I'll do now is walk you through some of the core takeaways of a couple of studies we ran. And we started with looking at off-the-shelf games to 
um, to use for prosthetic training, and we explored different types of control methods there. So in the car racing game, here we would use um, sustained muscle contractions. So you would flex to steer left, and you would extend to steer right. We gotta do a forearm next time, that's really awkward. <laughs> um, in the dexterity game you can see here, that's called pos pos. Uh, it also uses those sustained contractions, but you could only go left, right with them. So what you also need is a co-contraction, that was the clenching of the fist, where you uh, contract both muscles, um, to switch between controlling left, right, and, and up, down. And that really corresponds to how you would control a prosthesis. So with the prosthesis, you use the co-contraction to switch between different joints, or between uh, rotating your prosthetic hand and clasping, for example. And then we looked at a music game called Step Mania, which brings all these input types together. So it has uh, short contractions, sustained contractions, and co-contractions. And people play in rhythm with the music. So that turned out to be the most interesting game for patients. They both liked the input method best and also had the most fun while playing. Um, so to give you some takeaways, um, all these interventions led to clinically validated improvements in muscle coordination and muscle strength. And more importantly, those improvements also transferred to controlling a real prosthesis. Um, the patient you, can, patient you can see here, he has the electrodes attached directly to his left um, upper arm. And actually he refused to quit playing for three hours, so he really liked it. Um, and what we, say, what we saw is that playing those games, um, at least in the short term, leads to much higher engagement than um, compared with the, the normal uh, rehabilitation process. And what we also saw is that there is higher effort invested in individual training sessions. Um, so we're not here to say that we are going to replace uh, clinical training. Um, we consider games a good addition and to replace some of those sessions. Um, but there's still a need for, for coming in for in-situ visits, for psychological support, for orthopedic support, and also for, for normal, normal physiotherapy. And you can see that in the normal therapy, also games are used. Simpler games, but still. Um, so to get to game design a little. Um, remember the lipstick on the pig in the morning keynote? Yeah, so that's the, that's the same metaphor, just different takes. So that's Mary Poppins. Um, and games are often considered that sugar to make the bitter medicine, and the bitter medicine in our case is the training, uh, to make that go down better. Um, but although the patients perceived the games we presented to them, to them as fun, we found that it's not the primary motivator for them to engage with training. Um, the most important factor for engagement in general, and in training in particular, is the intrinsic motivation to get better, to be able to better control your prosthesis, to regain normality in life after such, after such a traumatic event. Um, and that's also why, why Cosima told you the fake story of me being a patient. So you could empathize with this horrific situation, which also brings with it a very high degree of intrinsic motivation. So what are games here for? Games are here for to support this intrinsic motivation that I have when I come to the clinic and uh, to help me get through that hard pro uh, process of getting better. Um, advantages that uh, patients also saw in the games um, were that they could also use them for training at home, um, that they could customize them, and also that the games would be good at adapting to their, um, to their progress in rehabilitation. So when they got better, they could have harder challenges and vice versa. Um, also games excel at providing good feedback. So that's general good game design practice is giving good feedback. And in our case, uh, it's on two levels. It's the biofeedback on your, on your interaction, um, but it's also the differentiated in-game feedback on overall progress, for example. So an ideal neuromuscular training game would be challenging, it would be high score oriented, and would be individually tailored to the skill level of patients. Um, and as a starting point for what Cosimo will now show you, we found that music games are potentially better suited for training because they are very simple in the input method, um, and they have a high potential to trigger immersion and flow experiences. Yeah, you can see that. And um, basically, what we wanted to do with Mile Beats is take this flow experience you can experience uh, to rehab. 
okay, so we wanted to make our own game. So we took the EMG training and put it into a game, a mobile one. One that the patient can carry around and play at home or play in a cafe. And you know, we're from Vienna and coffee houses are a very uh, yeah, highly cultural aspect of Vienna. <laughs> so, and the game we made is called Mayo Beat. And it was inspired by games like Dance Dance Revolution and Guitar Hero, which are in its own great games, but they were lacking a few things you know, which we needed for prosthetic control. So we made our own. The game control is just like the patient would control a real prosthesis. So it all works with EMG signal. And the electrode arm we use, it connects via Bluetooth to the tablet. And it takes a while until the patient is fitted with a prosthesis. So they use the app after surgery, so you can see it in the yellow line. They use it after surgery until the stump is completely healed or in rehabilitation while we train their EMG signals and wait for the prosthesis to arrive. Also, because we are a university hospital, we wanted to scientifically evaluate the app. So it's used for the patient. Does it actually improve? And patients had to play for four weeks at home for five times a week. And they only needed to come into the hospital twice, which is especially valuable for patients not living in Vienna or not even living in Austria, because we have a lot of uh, patients uh, from other countries. So they come in for the first time for the introductory session, we measure for the first time, and after four weeks, they come back for the final assessment. So we can evaluate if really there was something happening with their signals, if they really did improve in prosthetic control. And we also evaluated the system usability. So we asked them about the tablet, the app, the game, how everything worked together. And we asked different persons, game developers, doctors, patients. And you can see the patients, they were actually the least critical. They really liked it. So from a clinical perspective, we can say that training with a game really did transfer to an improved prosthetic control and patients are not afraid anymore to drop their coffee mug. <laughs> so what I'm gonna say after that. Um, so from, from a game design perspective, I'll close with three very specific takeaways. So first is games should always give good feedback, as I said, and that's both on the immediate interaction and on your overall progress. Second, uh, games used in this context must very sensibly adapt, not only to improvements, but also to setbacks you might have. And third, and most importantly, Games should do their best to sustain the intrinsic motivations that patients bring with them when they start their, their rehabilitation programs. So thank you for listening, and please feel free to try it out for yourself. It works now. <laughs>